Hello everybody, it's so nice to see everyone again, I hope everyone is doing fine, I hope everyone is, uh, well, off to a fairly easy, fairly smooth middle of the week, right, and that the previous couple of days uh, were, were a good thing. Um, we are here once again with the wisdom you need today on Wednesdays and for those who are tuning in for the first time my name is Olga I'm doing content and community at Spielworks meaning of course Wombat, Atomic Hub and now was there as well and uh, we do this thing well I try my best to do that weekly 
where we look around uh, at different concepts surrounding Web3, blockchain, uh, etc., etc. And we try to make sense of it, right? Uh, we try to accumulate knowledge, so to say. Uh, in a, again, I try <laughs> in an accessible manner. Uh, we have not gotten into super technical stuff for quite a while, right? And uh, I do try to pick up some of the more topical things, uh, things that a lot of people are, uh, well, speaking about online, something that you see in the headlines, something that you see that there's a rise, rising interest about and to in the Web3 world. However, this time, um, we are going to be talking about a concept that I feel like has been severely uh, un underrepresented la lately, right? Um, it has been a while, for a couple of years already. This is not something exactly very, very new. But for whatever reason, it hasn't really picked up. Uh, well, I'm assuming the whatever reason mostly being the fact that it uh, took off during 2021. And we all remember what the last few years have been uh, for the Web3 market. So today we're going to be talking about um, something very, very crucial for uh, your safety actually in privacy that's something being um dpns and blockchain routers we're also gonna be even um doing a little bit of drawing i guess um i hope that uh, this will also help uh, illustrate my point and um yeah we'll talk about that uh for a sort of an intro why I think this is important uh, we have seen time and time again right that uh, web 3 also why is it called like that right um, is perceived to be a sort of a new era of the internet in the same way as back in the day we moved on from a strictly broadcasting model right where you could only consume the content online but not contribute to it we move to a more two ways model that uh, inspired of course social media that inspired uh, user generated content platforms such as youtube etc etc um, web3 is perceived at least as this next big shift in our online behavior in online connectivity in how we effectively live and express ourselves on the internet uh, and that by the nature of web3 is characterized by uh, decentralization surprise surprise blockchain stuff right um, and in practicality while there are of course dApps that uh, are built in a decentralized way that use decentralized ledgers slash blockchain as the underlying technology, right? While there is this thing in principle, um, it does not effectively change the infrastructure layer of how we use it, right? So when we're interacting with, uh, when you're interacting with your wallet, for example, you log in, you sign the transaction, etc., etc. It's been broadcasted to the blockchain, of course. But the reality of the thing is, it's still using the old, um, the, like the old groundwork that is under uh, underneath it all. Right? You're still using your um, internet service provider. You're still uh, using the standards that were defined by ICANN. A long long time ago um, and the very few things that were uh, moving into the web 3 direction particularly on on that part 
Oh, what are we seeing? First of all, MCR Bad reached the 10 stream streak. Congratulations. That's a lot. And thank you, of course, for Sleepy Sly for subscribing. Much appreciated. But anyway, this is what we're going to be talking about today, right? Uh, something that transforms the basically the ground layer of those things and makes it more decentralized or like closer to the ideals of Web3 as we imagine it right now. I'm going to take a quick pause because I am sitting very uncomfortably. So just a quick mute. Beautiful. Now I feel even closer to you. Anyway, um, let's have a f like a first look at um, what DPNs are effectively. DPN, as you may imagine, um, is uh, that stands for a decentralized private network, right? I'm assuming that at least once in your lifetime you have been familiar uh, or like interacted with uh, with the standard predecessor so to say it's a virtual private network that is something that well people i'm not gonna point fingers at anyone obviously right that people use whenever they need to mask their traffic uh, VPNs have been instrumental in overcoming, for example, governmental censorship um, or, you know, accessing certain resources that, you know, uh, you would otherwise not be able to get a hold of uh, with your kind of own native connection that your internet service provider gives you. However, a, um, this is still very um, kind of superficial point in the sense that it effectively masks your traffic. It doesn't really do anything underlying there, right? Um, or in some cases, um, you could, I guess, say that... Uh, proxies so like intermediary connections that that are supposed to make it difficult to track things back to you um they're also serve the same purpose but it is very much still um kind of trackable um and it doesn't really do a lot for uh ensuring your privacy or it doesn't really do a lot um in terms of concealing where the traffic is from who runs it, right? Because with all of the VPNs, if your internet service provider decides that uh, this is a bad actor, uh, we're shutting it down, etc., etc., you could easily lose access to the internet. Oh, I'm seeing there is some fun happening in the chat. <laughs> Let the dogs out. Ah, Rising Dragons, you were riot today, along with Misty. And of course, yes, hello once again to everybody who has just joined us. We are uh, going down the rabbit hole of uh, decentralized private networks today. It's very fun to me at least, and I hope that it uh, will be to you. And anyway, well, what decentralized private networks do, they are changing this principle right so a decentralized private network effectively means that whatever data you're accessing it doesn't come from one server somewhere but instead it connects to another participant of this network or if you're very privy to the blockchain terms um, a node and that effectively uh, first of all reduces the load on your own channel right uh, reduces uh, the load on your bandwidth 
because everybody in that network contributes a little bit, right? So things are a little bit speedier and uh, that gives you an opportunity to get access to the stuff through the connection to that other person that is also part of the decentralized network. That is not um, available to you otherwise. Let's switch the screens a little bit and do some uh, some drawing, yeah? Please do not put a lot of hope in, t in my uh, drawing skills because they are absolutely terrible. Yes, I'm doing that very old school style with uh, Microsoft Paint. At any rate, here we go. So let's assume that we have a few um, we have a few or we don't oh that's a shame I have to... okay we do now we do I have an intrinsic desire to just, just... I don't know smash something anyway let me just do it like this okay so we have let's say those four little nodes right and they are for the sake of uh, this example they are in vastly different locations um so this is i don't know country one i know that this does not look any um uh, good particularly but bear with me this is like country or cd2 three and whatever other color four all right. And people in these countries, right, they all access the internet in the same way. Um, that would be the internet. It's just, uh, and imagine that there are, um, for every country here, this is a two way connection, right? So, there is an upload traffic and download traffic. That sort of a thing. Um, for some countries, um, this is not exactly the, the... Well, in practice, this is not exactly how it looks, right? So for some countries, uh, that's not always as accessible as for the others. What I mean is, um, for instance, if we're talking about China or any other country, there are only certain portions of stuff available both for downloading and uploading to the internet. That effectively does rely on the same tech. It's just, yeah, it's very special case but what happens if that is a um, decentralized network right what happens is a drastically different thing so if I just oh, I suck at erasing things but uh, let me retrace it what happens is that when people effectively unify in an independent network, those kinds of two-way connections are created directly uh, between people. Right? So let's imagine that this one line goes both ways, right? And this is here and here and it's all here. Beautiful. And a person from country one, being a part of that decentralized network, can access their own stuff on the internet and by providing a little bit of their bandwidth, 
through this connection to the other nodes located elsewhere, they can also access the internet stuff, the online stuff, freely uh, from those other countries too, without any sort of restrictions. So for example, whenever I would go to a news website that just, ha uh, you can all, almost always see a pop-up of sorts. Hey, looks like your region is that. Would you maybe love to watch, uh, would you maybe like to check out our other version that is specifically for that region? And that often entails, well, not only the language barrier issue, of course, right, but um, all sorts of other bias that might appear in coverage. And this is an example that can be extrapolated to many other things. With a decentralized private network, that would not be the issue. Uh, the reason for that is that it's um, very, very hard to pinpoint the traffic origin in that network, especially if those networks are very, very large, right? Um, what uh, Cointelegraph, for instance, said about them back in the day, um, just to give you a more scientific kind of an, uh, notion of it, right? Um, user devices act both as the client, like individual internet users, and the server, hence the, uh, the traffic explanation that uh, I just used. And IP addresses automatically change based on routing rules. The other important thing about, um, about the decentralized private networks is that typically, at least in the current architectures that exist in DPNs, so those, uh, those connections here, they are secured and private, right? Um, pairs also wonderfully with placing website uh, on the IPFS protocol, right? Where the blockchain validates the website contents, it validates your uh, kind of who accesses it, accesses it, which address and whatnot, and then just downloads the thing onto your machine. Ving Active Wolf says, boomers invent the Tor. The Tor is effectively very, very much like that, except for, um, well, Tor um, in itself has its own limitations and issues, right? And uh, Tor is entirely software-based. It's a browser, right? Whereas... Um, what I'm talking about is not necessarily that. Uh, Walk the Grid says Tor is a CIA. Uh, maybe, I don't know. I haven't uh, looked up the more recent conspiracy theories about Tor. But uh, yes, there are also reasonable concerns that because Tor, that is uh, still, well, a um, piece of software created by a specific company that might have a specific agenda and can be... Um, become a subject of external pressure as well, really easily, right? Uh, Tor, while it does offer more anonymity and whatnot, and it's built on the same principle as, uh, well, torrents, right? That also utilize this kind of a P2P um, traffic management system. Um, it does not necessarily guarantee you that um, you won't be subjected to any sort of espionage to make it a bit more dramatic. That thing, however, right here um, is not, as I said, necessarily software based, right? Um, there are companies, for example, that have, despite, as I said, uh, DPN not being a particularly super popular 
subject. Um, walk the grid. Uh, it's good that you mention exit nodes because this is also a point that I want to cover. Uh, there are companies that uh, cr effectively create hardware for this, right? And one of the companies that is still functioning is uh, Deeper. Actually, that's how uh, it's what they're called. Um, they effectively have a range of hardware products that uh, can give you access to a DPN of that sort. This could be, I don't know, like a Wi-Fi amplifier, a MIDI modem, things that you connect to your modem first and then to the computer, etc., etc. So that's a that's a flexible, nifty little thing. But the question again stands, if that's a proprietary DPN, um, where is the guarantee that they will not uh, somehow you know, uh, abuse access uh, and control over that VPN? Nobody knows, right? Uh, it's obviously clear that they will not be able to um, impact directly the traffic, right? Uh, who are uh, connected, what is, uh, what is shared, etc. Because it's uh, it's all anonymous, right? Uh, the only proof is the device, effectively. But it is still uh, a point of concern for some people, let's put it this way. Also going to um, send the links right now in the chat that uh, I used so that you guys can also check this out. Um, there is why I mentioned the FAFS. Uh, Four years ago already, uh, there were there was a presentation of a blockchain router that specifically utilized the IPFS protocol, right? So um, IPFS is a interplanetary file system. Right now, uh, it's mostly used for image storage, at least uh, on the blockchain, right? This is. If you go on any um, any kind of an NFT marketplace, uh, most of the times uh, the images for those um, NFTs are going to be stored exactly that. So there was a guy four years ago that effectively decided um, to extrapolate this standard uh, on anything and everything. So instead of downloading that, the idea was the same. Instead of downloading that from a centralized server, you are downloading that from a peer-to-peer -peer network. Exactly as the creator of the blockchain router said, um, kind of like BitTorrent, pirate-based stuff and whatnot. Um, this did, however, only offer um, access websites with a with a very specific domain name right so because it ran on the ethereum blockchain which again raises a few points because back then this was not um scaled up right um so it's not like you can access the entirety of the internet it's not like you have a choice which uh blockchain the validator nodes are running on and if it's something very, very hefty like pre-POS uh, Ethereum or pre-layer through pre-ZK of EVM, this can be quite hefty. Um, and like, not only are you going to congest the whole thing, um, but this is also not going to be a lot of fun for you using something so slow and uh, rigid, right? So right now, as far as I know, the router block, uh, the blockchain router, as is, it does not exist anymore. Um, they did, well, if it is them, because there is the router protocol uh, that is more focused on interoperability between other blockchains. Uh, 
than this, but yes. So this is an idea of roughly four years in the making that hasn't really uh, kicked off because uh, there are several reasons. I can see that we do have a few tech-savvy folks in the chat, right? And it's very good to be uh, aware of those things and know these things, but one, it does require a certain level of um, yeah, technical expertise to be able to set up and operate within such a network uh, successfully, frictionlessly, without any uh, without any issue. And IPFS, generally speaking, without any blockchain involved already, um, it is a bit, yeah, not exactly the uh, the best UX, so to say, and it is very technical. With the blockchain element tied to that, meaning you would have to interact with um, specific domains, run it on a specific network that can be a proprietary blockchain, which again, also, is it really that good? Question mark, right? And there are a few other concerns surrounding DPNs and the blockchain routers. Um, honestly, this was the last thing, uh, the last place where I expected to encounter this. Um, the value of the doubt, right, is uh, more in the comment section there than in the video itself, but also something for your um, viewing pleasure. Um, and also, you know, an actual expert that's talking about those things. There's a little bit of a critique surrounding that, right? And uh, Walk the Grid already mentioned exit nodes. This specifically is uh, what can be concerning because the reason for that is when we're talking about decentralized private network, uh, we're talking about uh, a lot of trust in the sense that you cannot manage what other people um, could be watching, downloading, uploading, whatever, using your particular node, right? Um, and let's not be naive. The internet can t uh, can sometimes be a very, very uh, sketchy, borderline dangerous place. Uh, and there are certain types of traffic you do not want um, your machine to process. Even if it is increasingly hard with more nodes in the network, right, to uh, trace it back to the um, original source of that uh it is very easy to get under the to the crossfire here um if a governmental entity or your internet service provider for example notices or even the well deeper for example as the um manufacturer of those devices of the, for the dpn access if they are somehow able to observe uh, the websites, the traffic there, uh, for the sake of compliance, let's put it this way, uh, if they notice that, okay, there is something really, really freaking illegal going on here, um, it will take them a while to uh, pinpoint it to the exact person who, uh, well, was the... Uh, perpetrator in that particular case but they will first come to you because this was your IP address so there we go there is also another very valid point um, that has been raised in this video and uh, also Ving Arctic Wolf is uh, giving an example here um I2P, for example, good project to uh, ensure anonymity and also grows more stable and more secure with more uses in there, right? There are also ways such as uh, 
an IPv4 address purchase, which well, I also do not recommend because as far as I know, in the States at the very least, it's not like it's bad juju to do this. Not sure uh, what about the other legislations. And uh, there are definitely, well, ways to uh, improve on that. However, we do have proof that, uh, well, at least applied to certain things, the logic of uh, decentralized networks does work and it does help. Uh, this is an example that I took from the video I posted about from the WAN show with the you next know, tech tips. Effectively, in a very, very similar fashion, uh, Microsoft is already doing that for the system updates, right? So effectively, whenever there is a massive Windows update rolling out, what they do is that they do not make um, everybody download uh, all of this data from centralized servers and whatnot. Uh, of course, at first, this was made easier by creating additional data centers, right, closer to some of the major, um, majorly like pop, pop uh, areas with dense population. Let's put it this way, to decrease the load on um, on the global network. Uh, but what they're doing now is is exactly that. So whenever you download a Windows update your PC, your device, and your internet connection that also kind of acts as a server so that whenever there is a person relatively close to you, right? Well, not like in the scale of the same flat, but, you know, um, maybe a house or two down. When they start downloading the Windows update, uh, they do not download it directly from the server, but they also kind of download the same information from you in uh, as non-invasive way as possible. So effectively, every every single machine that is currently running this update, at least within you know the same um, regulatory space, they effectively sacrifice a little bit of their bandwidth so that the download of the whole thing could get faster and smoother for everybody else. <laughs> Bill Gates joined the chat, says Rising Dragons. Uh, well, I mean, this stream was not sponsored by Microsoft <laughs> or Bill Gates, um, sadly. But this is just something that they do, and I think this is a very cool thing. Um, I would honestly love if more companies adopted the same logic for, uh, yeah, massive software updates or downloads because uh, imagine think back to summer last year if you live in a densely populated area with huge access to uh, entertainment to online technology and whatnot um you may have experienced uh, certain internet problems last uh, last August when everybody started downloading Baldur's Gate. And it very often happens that any major game release where A, a lot of people are interested, a lot of them are interested around the same time, and the game itself has a massive size, over 100 gigs. Uh, that can sometimes lead to the overall traffic problems in the vicinity, right? So it slows the whole thing down for everyone. Well, if that was handled in the same way as a DPN of sorts, right? Or as a, as a P2P kind of a data management thing, that would not be such a huge problem, I personally think. And all right, uh, you see, we have 
some of the things in the chat. Oh, you guys are really funny today. Walk the Grid says gremlins. What do gremlins have to do with that? They're just nasty little buggers that uh, you cannot get wet. Anyway. So yeah, that was me on uh, kind of the theory behind it all and the uh, critique. The bottom line is, I do think that uh, DPNs as a technology, they do deserve more attention and they do deserve more work on that, right? Because in reality, if we up until this day only really have one company that manufactures anything to support this, um, that's that's not really a good sign and it, it doesn't really help increasing um, the adoption of Web3 as an underlying tech for everything online, everything digital, um, the way that we imagine it. However, acknowledging the fact that there are already existing technologies that do help um, ensure the anonymity in at least some way, it is more important than ever to uh, kind of keep the main principle of Web3 in mind is that do your own research, decide what is good for you, because DPNs do come down with this major disadvantage of, uh, yeah, nobody really knowing um, what sort of traffic is being exchanged, which could potentially lead to a lot of problems for any person who uh, runs a node within such a network, really. And that's not something you want for yourself or for anybody else if you're a good person. That's it for today. I do thank you for sticking around uh, with me for this time. And uh, keep in mind that we will see each other this Friday on stream. I'm not sure yet which game I want to pick. I am, however, leaning towards um, a desktop title that we've had for a few, like a month, maybe. Um, and I haven't given it any particular highlight, even though it's amazing. So I do want to do that now. Rising Dragons is asking, who are we raiding? That is a fantastic question. Who are we raiding indeed? Um, thank you, Walk the Grid. I do hope that you found it useful. Let's see who's online. I will need to check it out because in my recommendations, as always, there's there's just some rubbish. But how about? How about we go and, uh, hmm, that's a tough one. Exotic MTG is playing big time. I think that this is going to be a lot of fun for you guys because it is a fun game. Do say hello to him from me, of course. Stay playing and slaying, and stay safe when exchanging data online. See you on Friday.